All right, bismillah walhamdulillah was salat was salam ala sayyid al mursaleen Muhammad al amin amma bad. So, uh, <coughs> alhamdulillah, we've progressed uh, to a certain point. Uh, but just to reiterate uh, our last video um, about the relationship between Prophet Muhammad and Prophet Musa, and uh, just so the audience will understand, we're talking about two time frames, right? Uh, one time frame is from Prophet uh, Ibrahim to Prophet Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad to the Mahdi. And one time frame is uh, from Prophet Musa to Prophet uh, Isa, and then from Prophet Muhammad to Prophet Isa again. And the uh, you can see the justification of these two time frames. We at, looked at one of them yesterday. Uh, which was from Prophet Musa to Prophet Isa and Prophet Muhammad to Prophet Isa. Over here, I want to uh, share with you uh, another justification for that uh, before we continue that I think is going to be interesting, kind of like a good overall review of what we discussed last time, which is uh, seen in these slides, you can say. It's also the timeline. So you have over here the timeline. The one in the middle is the timeline where they are... Uh, in the Holy Land, meaning Jerusalem, right? So the Jews start off in the Holy Land, they end up in Egypt through Yusuf <coughs> Then they leave uh, Egypt through Musa So we're basically starting our timeline from here, okay? And then you have the Assyrian Empire, you have the Babylonian Empire over here. And then finally, you have the Greeks, which then, you know, then this is where Jesus kind of like, so you have about 1,500 years here on this timeline from the Ummah of Musa to Isa, wassalam, okay? And you can also see over here in a little bit more detail, again, the same thing, kind of like uh, this is how it is from Musa uh, to Suleiman temple and this is also so when it, right when it's yellow in the middle that is the time where they're in the holy land you can say and so you have the assyrian empire the babylonian empire again the greek empire and uh, uh, that again is like we were saying 1500 years this there's a lot of other tables doing the same thing from different perspectives but i just wanted to uh shed light on that time span as an ummah, also that there is some similarities. Uh, because Imam Sayyuti and others have indicated uh, that the uh, lifespan of this ummah would be around give and take 1,500 years. It could be 1,600. Some scholars have said, if it's the ummah of Muhammad, it'll definitely have a little bit more than the previous ummah. Or you can say the right foot is dominant. You know how the Prophet says two shoes of a pair? So if one foot is more dominant, it'll be a little bit bigger. Um, this is one way to look at it. Um, <clears throat> and there's also the where the prophet prayed for an extra day, extra half a day. So one day plus half, one day with a lot is a thousand. And then half a day, um, half a day is uh, like uh, 500 years. So give and take. That much. There's another narration in Sahih Bukhari Kitab, uh, Kitab in the in the chapter of prayers, in which uh, the Prophet says the example of Bani Israel is, is from Zohar to Asr, and the example of my Ummah is like so. When you look at that, it looks like you know, but it's it's just a complete. Um, now, depending if you're using the Shafi'i method or the Hanafi method, it makes a big difference. Uh, um, okay. <clears throat> There's some background noise that's happening, so I'm going to just pause the uh, audio for a second, or the recording. So, Bismillah. So today we're going to discuss from Prophet Ibrahim to Prophet Muhammad, and the similarities between Prophet Muhammad and Prophet Ibrahim, alayhi salatu wasalam, and sallallahu alayhi wasalam. So please, yes. 
Uh, relating that back to uh, something we talked about yesterday is that yesterday we tried to establish in order to resolve the conflict in the Ummah between Shia and Sunni, um, the Zuriyat of Sayyidina Ali al-Islam being on the, on the wazan of uh, the Zuriyat of Sayyidina Harun al-Islam means that because the Zuriyat of Harun al-Islam had the mansab of imamat, in Ummat Musa alayhi salam, in our Ummat, uh, the Zuriyat of Sayyidina Ali alayhi salam has Imamat. But what that means in particular, we, we don't want to get into the conflictual territory just yet, but it's it's the same. And this is going beyond Shia and Sunni. It's talking about the Sunan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in regard to these Ummahs, so the patterns, the deep patterns, the deep structures that can be established very clearly from that sort of perspective. Now, uh, the second thing I want to mention at the beginning, uh, starting to go into today's content, is the Vakiya of Ahde Ibrahim. So we know that Ahde Ibrahim what happens first is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows Sayyidina Ibrahim al uh, a khwab or a dream and in that dream he's sacrificing Sayyidina Ishmael al -Islam, right? And, the, you know, sometimes we find this debatable, the Yehud say Sayyidina Isaac. I very strongly assert that it was Sayyidina Ishmael al-Islam because the, the hikmah is that, you know, your son is like your nafs. You know, your son is, is like your nafs. He's like your baka after you, right? So at that point, Sayyidina Ishmael al-Islam was the only son of Ibrahim al-Islam. Mm. So what Sayyidina Ibrahim al-Islam is being asked to sacrifice from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is his own baka after him mm. you know at a certain age when you reach a certain age when you're older and you have a son and then he's your only son right you're the nafs of your son is more important to you than your own nafs to some yeah, degree you know, when the child especially for men when the child is just a baby the man doesn't know what to do you know like what am i going to do with this thing right <laughs> you know he cries and he but once the child begins to help you like get me my scissors or get me this and and, and, and he becomes useful, like the way Ismail was for Ibrahim, helping him build the Kaaba. And you begin to see, okay, he's beginning to learn what I want to impart, right? So now he's really nafs in a sense, right? Because he's like a reflection of what you want for the future, right? So anyway, yes. Genetically and mimetically, if you have that mutabakat with your children, you know? And so... Um, so that's what Sayyidina Ishmael, uh, I mean, Sayyidina Ibrahim al-Islam is being asked to sacrifice is his, his own baka, his own existence after him, you know. And so that's what, that's the hikmah of the Qurbani, you know. And um, then Sayyidina Ibrahim al-Islam acts on it, but then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaces Sayyidina Ishmael with the ram. So what happens is once an Adi Imamat is a, is a, is ajr for that, is a reward for that, you know, that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Ibrahim, I will make you Imam al-Nas. And Ibrahim al-Islam immediately asks, and what about my zuriyat? And Allah says, my ad will not be with the zalimin. So what that means is that the ad is with the zuriyat of Ibrahim al-Islam with the shart that they are not zalim, that they are adil, right? they're not zalim. <coughs> okay, so at that moment, Ibrahim al-Islam does something very beautiful. So when he, the Ahdi Imamat is made, the, the Nishani of Adam is the Khatna, right? The, the circumcision is the sign of that Ahd. So everyone who has circumcision participates just in so that. that everybody is clear, this, he's referring to the verses in the Quran where Allah said, this, this is uh, close to ayah number 120. And Allah said to Ibrahim, I will make you an imam for the people uh, and for all mankind. Another translation, but anyway, uh, and he said, What about my progeny? And what about my progeny? My promise will not reach the wrongdoers, meaning there will be wrongdoers from the progeny of Ibrahim. And hence, because of the durud, then we can also extrapolate from that. There will be wrongdoers also in the, in the zuriya of Prophet Muhammad sallam, But they will not, the covenant is not with them. But once the zuriya of Ibrahim is acting righteousness, they have a certain covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to the Quran. Right? So that, that is what gets activated. Today. Or that is what uh, the genetic potentiality there, you can say, right? 
So both ways you can look at it. So the, the promise gets activated or the genetic, the, the genes get activated to, to something very core and deep in their past, right? Because of having the blood of prophets. And, uh, and then of course, if you have the blood of the prophet وسلم, there's something there, right? And the prophet also mentioned in another way where he talks about his own uh, his own genes. He said Allah kept purifying it and purifying it from Adam to Nu, from Nu to like, and the prophet describes it all the way till Quraysh and from Quraysh to Hashemiyah and then I was born. So this kind of like, um, uh, this kind of like uh, purifying the gene of the Prophet وسلم, to be ready for this great mission, right? While everything else, there are other great genes like the other prophets are also. Uh, but now we're looking specifically uh, Prophet Ibrahim and Prophet Muhammad وسلم. And the relationship between Prophet Muhammad and Musa is like the particularly I look at it as, as an ummah, right? as the, the ijma' of the, the whole ummah. But now with Ibrahim, it's more specific in a sense to lineage. Am I right? It becomes specific in terms of with Ibrahim to Prophet Muhammad and from Prophet Muhammad to, let's say, the Mahdi. Yeah. That's a difference with, I under, yes, uh, with Musa al-Islam, there's no direct lineage, but with Ibrahim al-Islam, there's a continuation of the pure istifat process, right? The yeah. Mustafa is increasing directly in the lineage. Okay, yes, please continue now on the new lesson. Okay, so, uh, okay, so going back to one thing I was mentioning before that Sayyidina Adi al-Islam, um, we established that his zuriyat is the imamat in our ummah, but the, the itrat, not the zuriyat, but the itrat of Sayyidina yeah. Muhammad. And by the way, uh, if I have a chance, maybe not in this video, because I didn't pull it out. All the ahadith of the Prophet, when the Prophet says the Quran in my itri, my family, right? Yeah. So Mahdi is also that family of the Prophet. And by the way, just so that any Sunni is listening to this, they should be clear that always... We've always considered the family of the Prophet as a role model. Uh, you know, Hassan and Hussein were role models. Uh, Nafsu Zakiya was a role model. They, meaning there's no Sunni Shia divide in this unless we do it as an allergic reaction to, because the Ahl Sunni, we accept the Sahaba as well as the family of the Prophet. And so there's no. Um, at a very baseline, there's no disparity, you know, and then you can go further than the baseline. The itarat of Sayyidina, the zuriyat of Sayyidina Ali al Islam is the imam, is, is the imam in Asal in our ummah. Uh, and then, but the itarat of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa which is zuriyat al hasanain maqsus, right? Zuriyat al hasanain has a new mansab, which is Sayyidi. Right, and what is the precise meaning of that? We'll get so imamat is one thing, and sayyidi is something new. So there's imamun nas and sayyid bani adam, right? So the zuriyat of imamun nas uh, is also imamun nas, but the itrat, the itrat of sayyid bani adam is also uh, has mansab as sayyidi. And so we're going to start. We'll go that into that uh, a little bit more, um, just to say it simply. Um, in 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 the Quranic language, right? You don't have a nafs; you have anfus, right? So you have a plurality. You have your own nafs. So there's a nafs, the nafs of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then there's the anfus of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, which is of course bani Adam, but it is also maksus banu Hashim, and then most maksus in our like living reality, it is the living sadat, are still the anfus of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that's deeply meaningful. We'll get into that inshallah. The second thing I wanted to because of the verse of the Quran, Aula bi anfusihim, the prophets closer to you than themselves, right? <laughs> and anyway, yeah, let's continue. The second thing I was talking about was the event that happened when uh, when Sayyidina Ibrahim al-Islam was given the Ahdi Imamat, right? At that point, he did something very particular. And so we know that 
in in the sharia of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the the sunan of the anbiya takes a muk- is part of the sharia right so it, as some things allah legislates and some things it is the fitra of the nabi which is which is it makes allah razi you know that's why they're chosen for that mansab they do something spontaneously from their own fitra from their own mizaj and that becomes part of the sharia something right that's innate to them they do something okay yeah uh, right. interestingly enough uh uh, Say Nursi Rahmatullah mentions the same thing, and he takes it a little bit further in terms of uh, a prophet according to his mizaj will emphasize different things. Like one prophet may emphasize, for example, helping the neighbors more. For example, one prophet may emphasize the belief, the aqidah, for example, uh, of the grave aspect more than, let's say, another aspect, or the hereafter aspect more than the grave aspect. According to their uh, mizaj, according to what they are inclined to and what they want to reveal, of what knowledge and how you know, like just like any human being, I might prefer certain subjects over other subjects that I think are important to my people or people I'm teaching. Right. So yeah. So like this, one of the things that's an expression of this is Sayyidina Ibrahim al-Islam doesn't only do khatna of. Uh, you know, Ishmael and his. I'm just clarifying. Khatna, khatna is circumcision. And so he doesn't only do the uh, khatna of um, Isaac and Ishmael and his other sons. He does the khatna of the uh, abids of his home, right? The abids, the slaves of him, his home. And if you if you're familiar with the story, Sayyidina Ibrahim al Islam at the end of his life, toward the end of his life, when when this happened, had men had much land, had much mulk. He was given a lot of gulam, and he had a lot of slaves, and he had he had abundance. You know, uh, he had a lot. This was at the end of his life, after Hijra, toward the end of his life, he had everything, right? So he had many like armies of gulam. He even went to war with an army that was his slaves at one point, right? So he does the khatna of these people. And, and why does he does that? Because Ibrahim al-Islam has this hilm, right? And his hilm, he wants good for everybody. So if he's given khair, he wants the khair for other people. Like he tried to stop for the azab and komal lut, right? He tried to intervene. He tried to be a shafi for that. But the, it w- wasn't accepted. But he has that hilm, right? He has that mizaj. And so he wants the slaves of his household to have the same khair as he and his sons have, right? On this wazan, on this wazan from the seerah of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we see something very beautiful, right? So, in my view, in my view, the Ahlul Bayt not only includes um, Sayyidina Khatija, the Niswatun Nabi, um, and also his uh, Sayyidina Ali, Sayyidina Fatima al-Islam, the Zuriyat of Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Fatima al-Islam, but it also, in a broader meaning. Ahlul Bayt Arabic has this beautiful literalism to it, right? So Ahlul Bayt, the people of the house, have uh, includes uh, the the abids of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and uh, the people like uh, what is it, Mola, right? The people Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam freed. So uh, Zaid ibn Haritha and Osama ibn Zaid, in a broader sense of the meaning, are also Ahlul Bayt. Maybe not to the same degree, not in the same way, maybe, but to some degree. Because they are the people of the house, right? And so, um, so what did it end? Um, Salman al Farsi, right? The Ahlul Bayt used to say themselves that Salman is one of us. Mm-hmm. And why is this? Is because the when you are in the in the position of being a slave or an abid to a high house like a noble house, right? When you're their mola or you're their uh, what's a vassal, I think, or you're their slave, you're their abid. You're in this position where you can have an intimacy with that household, even though they don't ha- you don't have their blood. When you submit that fully, uh, you have the slim that fully, you know, you put yourself in that humble position in relationship to that household, which is appropriate for the uh, Betun Nabua, right? It may not be appropriate for any other house, but it's appropriate for Betun Nabua. It's appropriate for... I, this is why I like the word Ali, like Ali Imran or Ali, Ali, the Ali Fir'aun, because it not includes just the royal family, but includes all the people that are loyal in the yeah. broader perspective to the family of Firaun in this case, Ali Firaun, right? So you have the uh, the Ahlul Bayt as defined within the Quran as the Ahzab. And then you have Ahlul Bayt as defined in the sayings of the Prophet So there's a divergence there, right? So in the Hadith, it makes it specific. 
And uh, in the Hizam, it's general. I couldn't hear what you were just saying. Can you repeat that. Uh, I was saying that there, for me, there's not a divergence. There's tadbik to be that can be done. But I, I, please continue. Inshallah. No, no, Bismillah. Continue, please. Between on this topic or going back to what we we're talking about? No, going about? back. Let's go back and then we'll extend okay. from here. Okay. So, um, so, so we see that you know they have the vazan, and so. Um, now let's go to this these istalahat that relate uh, Sayyidina Ibrahim al-Islam to Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? So the so term is, istalahat means terminologies. So there's um uh, there's Khalilullah and Habibullah. There's Imam al-Nas and Sayyidina Ibrahim, uh, Sayyidina Walid Adam, and there's also uh, if we look at the muqamat in in the miraj, right? of Ibrahim al-Islam and Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa relative to each other. So let's begin there, inshallah. So because the miraj has the most haqiqat, it's like shiddat the haqaiq, right? Like once you understand this very re substantial truth is there. And so uh, Ibrahim al-Islam is sitting on the Kaaba, on the, the what, what's the Betul Mamur? Ma Ma yes. Right, he's sitting at the Betul Mamur, which is the metaphysical Kaaba on the seventh heaven, and he has his back and he's resting on the Kaaba. So he's resting. It's it's Allah. Um, uh, Allah Samad. So Samad is the thing you rely on, the push on your on your back, the thing that is behind you, the mountain that you put at your back strategically. That's so, right. Yeah, so Ibrahim al Islam has this, you know, he has that reality very strongly where he has tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all things. Very strong tawakkul. So that's symbolized by him just resting on the Kaaba, right? Like this, he's he's up there. But Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I like to use a word. There, there's, uh, it's from English, Old English. It's called the antechamber. The antechamber. And the antechamber is the room that is behind the throne. Right. There's a small room that is behind the throne. Right. So that is a, the king doesn't invite everyone into the antechamber. That's a very place of intimacy if you go there. Right. The, uh, so I like to use it's not from the it's not from our Rivayat, but it's just to show something. Make a point. Yeah. yeah. Is, is the term I use is that the muqam that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was taken to was the antechamber. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this very story where we have Siddhat al-Muntaha and beyond Siddhat al-Muntaha, Zir Jibreel, who has guided Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from, from Ard all the way through the seven heavens, through the Asma, now cannot go past Siddhat al-Muntaha, right? He cannot go past it. And, and there's hikmah to this, inshallah, we'll, we'll talk about that some other time. But um, he cannot go past it, but Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is raised beyond this, you know, and he's taken into the muqam that I'm calling the antechamber, right? Um, so, so you see Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has an even higher muqam beyond the seventh heaven where Sayyidina Ibrahim al-Islam is, right? So for this, for me, this demonstrates clearly the meaning between Khalilullah and Habibullah, right? right. They're, they're intimates of Allah and but one has a higher level okay now let's go on to Imam al-Nas and Sayyidi Waladi Adam and this will be the basis of the rest of the video inshallah so Imam al-Nas is again it's the thing that all of humanity all of humanity has to put Ibrahim and Zuriyat Ibrahim al-Islam before themselves so they have to put themselves before their own anfus, right? So in, in the deen, we have this like the hakuk kuraba, hakuk ashira, you know, uh, the hakuk rahem. You know, this is very strong in our deen. You know, if, and I'm sure you know a lot of hadith on this matter. But it's, it's very strong that we have to fulfill the hakuk of rahem. So what this does is the my own kabila, my own family, my own household, right? It, it spaces a strong emphasis on that. But when you have an imam un nas that Everybody has to put the zuriyat of Ibrahim before their own qom, before their own anfus. This is a markaziyat, right? There's a mar markaziyat to this. And then especially when you get to our ummah with Sayyid uh, Waladi Adam, this is a thousand times stronger for the Ahlul Bayt, is that, yes, hakuk Raham for our own families, but then the, the, the family of the Prophet Sayyid Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we have to prioritize them over ourselves because it has markaziyat. This is what unifies the whole ummah. You have the Chechens, you have the Indonesians, you have the Pakistanis, you have the Albanians, you have the Arabs. You have, but the, the Markaziyat is the family of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam who unifies. And then the Sharf is from that. 
that. So if their sharf is from that, so their own interest is in keeping the ummah together for having the interest of the ummah at heart. I don't know if you want to say something on that, inshallah. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, <clears throat> obviously, uh, if we're from different places, then the family of the Prophet can at many times will become, has been a center of unity, you can say. Uh, because the whole ummah can agree upon, okay, uh, you know, I'm from this place, you're from that place, but we can agree to humble ourselves before uh, the family of the Prophet in a sense that uh, it will bring unity, right? And it's, it's, it's a common point uh, between us. So it does play a very important role and will play a very important role uh, in the future. Um, uh, and so this is where the prophet is alluding to when he says, my itri, my family, uh, will be a source of guidance. And, uh, and then, of course, if they're righteous, uh, then it almost, you know, according to Imam Shafi, I mean, the Shafi fit is the most uh, uh, strong on this, that, you know, there should be no Khalifa except he's from the Quraysh or he's from the family of the prophet. And Imam Shafi himself was from the family of the Prophet, by the way. Uh, and uh, I think he's the only one of the four big fuqaha that was from the family of the Prophet. But uh, the point I'm trying to make is that um, he, this, uh, if you have a righteous person from the family of the Prophet, choosing him as an emir or as a khalifa uh, allows more unity uh, than... Uh, this, you know, this scholar from this place or this scholar from this place um, allows for more tolerance. And, and there's a lot of other spiritual advantages of that. Right. So. Okay. Um, so uh, one thing I do want to mention here again is that in Islam, we have this mizaj, right? Uh, do you want to translate mizaj to like attitude? Attitude. How would you translate? attitude? attitude. Uh, yeah. Right. We have this attitude where we don't like speaking a uh, bemani call. Uh, we don't like bemani call. We like bamani call, right? Like mm -hmm. we like. Please, could you? Um, uh, we like saying meaningful things. We don't like saying unmeaningful things. Yes, and so it has been the sunnah of our ummah. It has been the umum of our ummah to refer to the itrat of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as Sayyid, right? And so Sayyid is a meaningful term, right? It has meaning to it. It is not just something. Uh, it's not like Mister So and So, Miss So. -and, -so. and it's used it in the Quran. Sayyid wa hasura wa nabiya min al salihin. Sayyid means leader and has a, a certain. Anyway, yes. Please continue. Um, and, and okay, just to, uh, it means leader, yes, but it also kind of like etymologically and literally it means master, mm. you know what I mean? It, yeah. So I'm not, I'm not overemphasizing that, but I'm just saying that it's, it's strong. It's an intense word, right? Mm. And there's a reason that the, 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 uh, the itarat of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is referred to that in that manner is because again, they metaphysically, not biologically, but metaphysically have been given more access. If they are muttaqi, they follow the sunnah, they have adala, then they have been given exceptional access to Nur and Muhammad and the ability to embody that in our ummah. And we need, it, it is an institution that after Khatme Risalat and Khatme Nabuat, we need this sort of institution where you have some people who, ha, if they observe taqwa, they have ability through Wahiya Khafi, not Wahiya Jadi, through Wahiya Khafi to do Tahweel of the Quran. You understand through Wahi and they have an, ex an exceptional tahafuz, or at least the potential for exceptional tahafuz of Wahi. I don't think you mean tahwil al Quran. Tahwil al Quran would mean to change Quran. You mean tahfiz al Quran, probably, to, to protect the Quran. I meant interpretation. Or ta'wil. You mean ta'wil. Okay. Yeah. Not ta'wil. Okay. Yes. Over here, I want to mention something uh, in the process of unfolding history. Um, so there's certain things Allah has put in place as kind of like protection for the ummah, right? So in terms of places, mustaqil, yani, uh, uh, or mustamir, uh, places that have always been a place of guidance, the place that Allah, the Prophet of Allah has always pointed to is Syria, the people of Sham. 
you know, they'll play a role from beginning to the end in terms of guidance. And then the other places like Najad, they'll always be like a source of fitna. So that's in terms of places, right? So the ulama of Syria are very important in that sense, right? And that technically includes Yemen, Palestine, this whole area, okay? These people, they have a certain level of guidance that uh, that is, there's a certain potentiality there that is not there in other places. Then you have the mujaddideen in Allah, Yabasu ala ra'si kulli mi'atin amin man yujaddidu laha dinaha. That Allah raises in the beginning of every century people that will revive the deen. So this is the second thing that's happening in the process of history. The third is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaces people, one people with another people, and gives guidance to the new people over the previous people. So like you see, the guidance was with the Arabs. This is again referring to some things that Dr. Sarah mentions, that certain people had guidance and then it was given to other people. And the Arabs had guidance and it was given to the Ottomans. Ottomans had guidance, now it's been given to another. You can say in that, in that sense, in terms of the Mujaddideen, the Indian subcontinent probably, probably plays the biggest role currently. Um, so you have, the Indian subcontinent and the ulama there, particularly, uh, I consider, like for example, Mahmoud al Hassan, uh, Sheikh Sheikh Mahmoud al Hassan, and then from there, all the other uh, babies that were born from there, like whether it's Tablighi Jamaat or Alama Iqbal or Abu Kalam Azad or all these different, right? And then we're like essentially a part of that inheritance. <laughs> so you have Syria, you have the Mujaddideen. And then with the Mujaddideen, you have one people being replaced by another people collectively as the flag bearers of Islam. Then also in this, especially now when, especially in times of fitan, uh, in times of fitna, and it's not, you know, remember when the Prophet said to Ali, Satakuna fitnatun, soon there will be a fitna, right? So it's Ali, the Prophet is telling Ali, radiallahu anh, right? Ali was the Khalifa at the time of fitna. Mm -hmm. Right, so the family of the prophet is, is because in a time of fitan, when people are in disarray, they, they can't tell what's right, what's wrong. Well, one of the things to consider, heavily consider, is what is the fam people that are righteous in the family of the prophet, what are they doing? Right? Because there's certain things that just being from the family of the prophet, you're not going to betray if you're righteous, right? Whereas a righteous person with good intentions who's not from the family of the Prophet may unintentionally end up betraying certain aspects. For example, it's very easy for, uh, it's easier, not very easy, but easier for a certain person who's not from the family of the Prophet and he has good intentions and he's studying Islam to reject hadith total. Like, I don't accept hadith. Meaning it's easier, conceptually easier. But the very fact you know you're from the family of the Prophet and that lineage is authentic. So that sanad is there. It's going to be much harder for somebody in that position to say, no, I reject all hadiths, right? So there's a certain, you can say, uh, dormant or kinetic, kinetic uh, potentiality that allows them to be guided in a certain, there's a certain thrust, a certain push. Yeah. Uh, that they'll that if they're guided they'll necessarily be in a certain direction, okay, and uh, and then of course uh, people that are of uh, that have the du'as of the prophet then their dreams, their their uh, their ilham a certain type of internal thinking and inspiration, right? Uh, if you are going to somebody like if there's somebody from the family of the prophet and you respect them uh, or you uh, incline towards them, then the prophet is already inclined towards his children, the way Ibrahim was inclined towards his children, right? So now you're getting closer to the prophet in that respect, right? <coughs> and there are many people who have had dreams that just for um, one, hadith, but one hadith on that point is shortly Hazrat Abu Bakr radiyanhu actually said and you know Hazrat Abu Bakr radiyanhu doesn't have a lot of hadith he said on that that um, fulfilled the hakuk of Nabi sallallahu alayhi sallam by fulfilling the hakuk of his family yeah and Omar used to say radiyallahu an that uh, I, I prefer the family of the Prophet over my family mm -hmm. right and uh, he said this to his son 
meaning that you, I, I don't care about you as my child, but what the children of the Prophet, uh, their position is, is, is much more important. So there, there are different sources of guidances Allah has put, whether it's through the Mujaddideen, whether it's through a certain location. And all this comes true in the end of times. The location is Syria, right? Uh, the family of the Prophet. And so all these things are going to like uh, come true, both in a sense for Ibrahim, as well as, uh, because that was the wish of Ibrahim, his Prophet Muhammad and his progeny, right? If I can mention this in another spiritual dimension, um, Dark Sub says this, also, and so I wanted to bring that up, is that, you know, the greatest reward a person can have in the path of Allah is to be shaheed, to be killed in the path of Allah. But there's another aspect to this, is that if you're presenting yourself to Allah, and you say, here's my children, and that those children say, here's our children, and our children, and they're all righteous, going back many generations, right? So this idea of Ali Imran, the family of Imran, right? One of the things that we've lost now that is extremely important is that the deen has been kept. And if you look at history, you'll see this. The deen has been kept alive by families who lived Islam, mm -hmm. not individuals who lived Islam, by families that lived Islam. And so in Allah, astafa Adam. So first it was just individuals, Adam wa Nuha, wa ala Imran, wa ala Ibrahim. Like, so for example, that Allah chose certain families, right? And it's that family that's working for the deen, completely dedicated to work for Islam. And a lot of times that happened from the people from the family of the Prophet ﷺ. throughout history. If you look at the scholars of history, many of the people that were full-time dedicated as a family were, um, were fam people from the family of the Prophet, that the whole family is righteous. Uh, okay, so what, what was I trying to say? I was trying to say that a lot of these potentialities come true in the end of times, like, together. Um, you know, anyway, so... Please continue. I only wanted to make the point that, that it's not individuals, it's the family. That many times in a certain locality, uh, even in, the, in, the, in this industrial age, a lot of times it's certain families. Like the Habaib, for example, that's a family, right? I don't know if you know about the Habaib, but a lot of times it's an entire family that, you know, they have a pious elder, a grandfather, and then his let's say three, four sons, they're also pious, and then their grandchildren are pious. Look at Dr. Sahim, what he did. Yep. Right? You know, he became pious, uh, technically, right? And then he brought his whole family into it, his brothers, his sisters, his children, right? They weren't maybe, they were religious in the maybe cultural sense, but now his whole family is working for the deed because of this one person. And I think, you know, in, in some ways, that's a great accomplishment for a person to do, to bring his whole family into the deen. That's a very big accomplishment. And so, uh, but there's a certain potentiality that is, you can say, the, 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 that is much greater when the family of the prophet does this. And they rise in ranks very, very quickly. Yes. Uh, in this, in this, Yes. And, and so there's also this sense where Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you look uh, at Abdul Muttalib, right? Abdul Muttalib, his grandfather, and you look at his father, Abdullah, and before Abdul Muttalib also, you have these ancestors, you see the intensity of istafat or mustafaviyat increasing even before Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And even with uh, Maryam al Islam, the, the tahara of her uh, nasab is increasing over time, right? And even uh, if you look at Imam al Mahdi, uh, you know, before him, the, he his istifat of his nasal is increasing all the way until you have actually Muhammad ibn Abdullah, Imam al-Mahdi becomes Zahu. So there is this, you cannot, uh, uh, you can maybe, if there's a metaphysical difference, do Alana Barat from your family, but you cannot uh, separate yourself out from like a common destiny and we're organically related to our ancestors and the dean really strongly emphasizes that 
And uh, there is metaphysical consequences of who your ancestors were, but there, there's definitely biological consequences, you know, but th there's definitely also metaphysical consequences. That's not to say that, you know, you can't have Umar ibn Abdul Aziz from Banu Maya. You can have that, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not to say that it can't work the opposite way where, you know, one of the- Again, what does Umar ibn Abdul Aziz do? One of the first things he does is restores the rights of the family of the Prophet. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Right, so a righteous, something. the righteous man will, meaning who's not from the family of the prophet, mm -hmm. one of the first things that he'll naturally, I mean, I, I just don't see it any other way, that one of the first things a righteous person will do is to restore the 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 family of the prophet in their proper status, mm -hmm. which is what the Umayyads always fought against until Umar bin Abdul Aziz, mm -hmm. right? And they used to curse the family of the prophet. Yes. Uh, in the Umayyads until Umar bin Abdul Aziz abolished that and said no. And uh, so instead of like cursing the family of the Prophet at the end of every khutbah, I mean, imagine this is not even like, it's not even a hundred years after the Prophet and they're cursing his family. Mm -hmm. So uh, he re that's where he replaced it by the famous line that almost every Jummah khutbah we hear. See, and do right to your relations. So we, okay, anyway, so yes. And I, I won't, um, I also want to admit this, acknowledge this reality. There is also a pragmatic alignment of interests, right? So, uh, you know, that from a play of Hikmah and Adala, of course, the Ahlul Bayt have their maqam, but as someone who is Zuriyat Ahlul Bayt have been given a stake in the Ummah, even from a pragmatic perspective, right? Because the, the more the Ummah does well, and of course the Ummah cannot do well until they have Adab of Ahlul Bayt, it cannot happen, but, it, but when the, they do have adab and the ummah is doing well that's when the natural interest of the alul bad so is also you know uh, abundance you know it is also increasing so there's been there's this hikmah to it even from a pragmatic perspective there's an alignment of interest between the unity of the ummah the uh, the ikamut of the deen and, and the interests of the alul bad have been put together in a very beautiful sort of way just as a very side point, so should the we... people that have been uh, listening to me for a while, the relationship between Khorasan and Syria is also established in the end of times, which is another place the Prophet points to, at least in the end of times, right? And going off of your point, just really quickly, uh, I've uh, when we get to the eschatological, finally to the eschatology aspect of our conversation, I also strongly emphasize Khurasan, and I believe that Imamat actually, the actual nazm of the deen, the final nazm of the deen will be established in Khurasan, and that's why the armies will come from there for Imam al-Mahdi, but there will be a darja bandi, there will be a hierarchy of Imamat where the, I don't know if you know this or you agree with this, but I believe the Pashtuns are Hebrew, they're Hebrew. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of Muslims are catching on to that. The other possibility, just so that your eyes are open to this possibility, is Muslims in Africa. They were also Hebrew, and many of them have also become Muslim. So just as just so that we don't lose the, so so the Pashtun are definitely Hebrew. The, the, the Jewish. Uh, lost tribes of the Jews are have seem to have a lot of Jewish uh, ancestry. There's no, you yeah. know. Use of they, for example, you know, so uh, so there's no doubt about that. The other possibility is Muslims in Africa, and, and one day I want to talk about that. And maybe these again might merge. A lot yes. of these things might merge uh, in places like Turkey, where the Prophet says it will be the Banu Ishaq who will yep. come to Turkey. So Banu Ishaq could be uh, Muslims uh in a muslim alliance with another muslim alliance meaning muslims in africa having an alliance with afghanistan working together and so then that can be banu uh, ishaq also but anyway the potential is there is what i'm saying yeah. Exactly. And they're part of who all of those who wherever they are, Africa, Khurasan, or uh, even the Palestinians, I believe, all of them have are in Ahadi Imamat. 
they participate in Ahd Imamat, their Zuriyat Ibrahim, right? So they're part of Ahd Imamat. We'll get to that in Eskatal when we finally get there after we do our Muslim history. But okay, to finish, let, let's start uh, going back to Ibrahim al Islam. So we see that there's a cl cl clear misal between Ibrahim al Islam and Sayyidina Muhammad. Sallam. I think we've established that pretty clearly. Now, the other it's misal. In the all the time, mm -hmm. right? That there is this link between the family of Ibrahim to Prophet Muhammad mm -hmm. and the way Ibrahim prayed for a Muhammad mm -hmm. Muhammad Sallallahu is praying for a guide mm -hmm. that represents him in his ummah and that's why we're specifically this is the difference between salams and sal salah right mm -hmm. salams is like I say assalamu alaikum to you so you're saying greetings to the Prophet like Assalamu ala Rasulullah. So, Assalamu alayna wa ala ibadillahi salihin. So, salams is for everyone and salams to the Prophet. Like, Assalamu alaikum ya ahlul qubur. Peace be upon you, O people of the grave. Right? So, salams is for everyone. But salat, salat is that connection that has to do with the mission. <laughs> okay? So, many scholars have clarified this the difference between the salam and salat. And one of the interesting aspects of salat. Uh, which is has to do with the 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 mission that they were given. So when we are saying Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad, Kamal salaita ala Ibrahim, the way you did salat, the way you fulfilled the mission of Ibrahim to build the Kaaba, to have Hajj, people coming here every year, and then finally the coming of the Prophet, the way you fulfilled those uh, uh, desires or that mission of Ibrahim, fulfilled those desires of Prophet Muhammad and his family, right? And Al is very broad. It is specifically his family, but then those people that are loyal to him and his family and his cause, mm -hmm. okay? And so that, so that, what I was saying when I was talking about uh, Dark Sub and his family, I was saying, so Ibrahim shows up on the Day of Judgment. He's like, these are my two sons. And behind Ishaq is all the prophets. And behind Ismail is Prophet Muhammad. So, so that was his wish, and that's what he presents. The Prophet also, like Ibrahim, wishes that I present uh, behind me a progeny like Ibrahim on the Day of Judgment. That Allah, look at Hassan, look at Hussein, look at Zainul Abidin, look at Nafsu Zakiya, so on and so forth, right? So all these righteous people that come after the Prophet that are from his progeny that he can be proud of. That these are like, this is a fulfillment of my dua, so to say. Yeah. Yes, of course. And um, the, also for, and then the way Ibrahim al-Islam and Isaac al-Islam are what you're saying, they're the source of the progeny, the, the muttaqi progeny of Ibrahim al-Islam that will make him happy on the Day of Judgment. In the same way, Hassan and Hussein are the source of the progeny that will make Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa happy on the Day of Judgment, right? So there's also now a tasbih that I have to make between Ismail al-Islam and Sayyidina Hassan al-Islam and Sayyidina Isaac al-Islam and Sayyidina Hussein al-Islam, right? So when we, at the beginning of the video, I said in their capacity as the sons of Sayyidina Ali, they are the imams, right? Along with all the other children of Sayyidina Ali, right? Even the ones not from Fatima al-Islam, they have the mansab of Imam Ahmad. But in Maksus al Hasanin have this mansab of Sayyidi in their capacity as the metaphysical sons of, of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So here we're talking about that capacity, right? So um, in the capacity, in as far as... He, um, uh, and this is where we get into the 12 Imams also. I, do you have a view on the 12 Imams? Would you, would you explicate that so I know who I'm responding to? My feeling is that they were righteous people from the family of the Prophet, and they had the hearts and the minds of the people of that time, more than the kings did or average people did. You know, starting with the, I consider, like Abu Hassan Nadwi, rahmatullahi the Mujaddid of the second century is Abu Has uh, 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 Hassan Basri <laughs> from the family of the Prophet. He is the Mujaddid of the second century. And then Abu Hassan Ashri in the third century after that. So starting with Umar bin Abdul Aziz, then Abu Has Hassan Basri. Rahmatullahi <laughs> and so, uh, again, so he was the Mujaddid of the uh, second century. So 
I consider the Imams to have been not in the context of how we see them today in terms of the archetypes of Shia and Sunni, but as history played out itself within that time as we look back. These were righteous people in righteous families trying to stand up for the deen and fight for the deen, which is why a lot of the time the family of the Prophet is the only family that ended up fighting against the Umayyads, fighting against that oppression over and over and over again. So whether it was Imam Zaid, like the Zaidi Shias are closest Shias to the Sunni, right? And we really need to create a dialogue with the Zaidi Shias for that reason. Uh, because uh, anyway, so what does Imam Zaid do? Imam Zaid does, he leaves the Umayyads, establishes his own Khilafah according to the Sharia, right? And uh, the Zaidi Shias are some of the best Muslims you'll find uh, in, in, in the world today. Again, this is in that same area where Syria, this whole area of Syria, where these, these types of Shias are in a much closer position to us than uh, the Ithna Asharia. And, and th there's many reasons for that, which uh, we can go into, because I think there's a, there's a, there's uh, Ali Shariati, I like the way he divides it, uh, which is that he calls uh, the Shias, the black Shias and the red Shias. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but the red Shias are the mourners, right? They're just always crying. And, you know, this happened and this happened in history. And they look at everything through the lens of mourning and how everything went wrong. And uh, that ends up with a lot of negative emotions. But he says the red Shia are the Shias that look at the justice aspect, right? The, the Adala, right? Justice. And so he says, so that is what has happened over time with uh, Shia uh, is that they started off with Adala, but then it became a rituals of mourning ritualistic and uh, a lot of uh, ritualistics of mourning the loss of Hassan and Hussein and their horse and so on and so forth. And, and Karbala, instead of becoming a icon of standing up to justice or the last stand for Khilafa, so to say, as I see it in my mind many times, they see it more like they look at the negative aspect of it. And so, um, so, so for me, the Imams, they're definitely uh, righteous uh, people. I don't consider them uh, like, uh, like prophets. No, that, I don't accept that. Uh, I don't consider them to be completely sinless. Obviously, they did their sins and our sins are, you know, their good deeds were like our sins. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like that. But anyway, the point being that they weren't prophets, but they probably had ilham, they probably had gash, they probably had a level of guidance that's very clear from their words. If you just read the, uh, the, um, the, the dua of, I think it's Zaynul Abidin, uh, it's called as sajda or Saji. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's, 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 their dua books, if you just read their dua books, it's, it's very powerful. Um, and uh, if you read, for example, uh, Joshin Kabir, uh, have you heard of Joshin Kabir? So anyway, their dua books are like, you know, and uh, a long time ago, people used to focus on what is called munajat and duas of, of even the righteous people to kind of like get an idea of their mindset, right? So there's definitely something special that's gone on there. And I remember being in a conference in which uh, one of my teachers was there. So I was there. And uh, in the conference, we said to one of the Shia brothers that was there, is that why don't we go back and agree upon the Imams? Why don't we go back and agree upon the early Imams of the Shia? And he said, no, that's not enough. Because there's no conflict in doing that. <laughs> you know, There's no conflict in going back to the Hassan Basri or Zainul Abidin or uh, Ali bin Hussein, there's no conflict there, uh, you know, so, um, and, and they, they understand that this thing was evolving even for them to what it's become today. Um, so I don't know if you want to say something to what I was saying, but yeah. Um, well, I'm really excited to hear your views on it because that's not exactly typical Sunni views, right? And even in Dr. Saab's halaka, that's not exactly, you know, the type of views I've encountered before. It's very similar to my thought and I'm excited to get into. So if you look knowledge. at early, uh, you know, I've asked Dr. Saab about this and. Uh, oh, he, I would love to hear that. What would yeah. you say? No, I mean, 
it didn't come out in his lectures or his remember there's always a difference between what a person's trying to emphasize in his lectures is his movement or his yeah. thought or his philosophy versus his personal like um his personal feeling you can say yeah. and if you talk about like for 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 dr hasan and hussein were very pivotal because in his thought, if you remember even the roundtable talks, he said this when um, uh, Abu Rabi, one of the professors that was asking questions, he said something about, what about this in Islamic history and this Islamic history, this Islamic history? And Dr. Saab said, for me, Islam ends with the Sahaba. You know, that's Islam from the Prophet to the end of the Sahaba. The Ijma in technical terms, the Ijma of the Sahaba. And that Ijma of the Sahaba, the, the, the Sahaba, the history of the Sahaba, technically begins to end with Hassan and Hussein, right? I mean, that's like the last of the big, big ones, the last of the big standing ones. So when, like, for example, um, one of my first, uh, when I came from Azhar, one of my first questions in Dr. Sahar, he was in Canada and uh, I had come for the summer. I was going to go back. Uh, so uh, when I came and then, I had a chance to ask him some questions and I asked him about Hassan and Hussein and this whole, and, you know, he says, when you open up the history books, there's a wide range of, uh, like, depending upon who's writing history, they're writing different things. Some were pro Hassan and Hussein, some were against Hassan and Hussein, you know, all this, this whole scenario that's become very conflicting for us. And, you know, Darsab's way of looking at everything is through the Quran. So he's even looking at, Hassan and Hussein through the idea of, uh, of pro so he said look there are two extremes this is negation this is affirmation and then he put his hand here like towards the affirmation right that they were the ones on haq they were on the right and so I mean I was very clear about that from Dark Sub uh, from the very and this was one of my first uh, encounters with him uh, I mean so uh, he was very much like, yes, that, that what Hassan and Hussein, I mean, if you ask the question to many Muslims, especially our Salafi brothers, if you say what has Hussein did stand up for Khilafah, did he do right? Many of the Salafi brothers will say, no, he did wrong, right? But you also have Sunnis will say, no, he did right. You have many more that will say, no, he did right. But you have some of the Muslim brothers on the Sunni side who will say he did wrong. And, uh, you know, in one of the lectures of Dr. Sarmad, he, in fact, uh, you know, he appreciated this particular Shia scholar because of what he explained of history. I don't know if you remember this particular conversation of his, but, you know, he was talking about um, that they had given a fatwa in Kufa and uh, that, that uh, you know, uh, that uh, Hassan, uh, Hussein is on the wrong because he's challenging the Khalifa. And so therefore he deserves, because the, 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 uh, the saying, I forget in Arabic right now, but the translation of it is that Hussein was killed by his grandfather because of the saying of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that if somebody challenges the Khalifa, you kill him. So they saw Hussein as challenging the Prophet. So the fatwa was given, kill him, you know, uh, so, and anyway, why am I saying this? I'm saying this is that as history is playing out and as we look back at history, where do you side? Do you side on the people that killed Hussein? Or do you side on with the people? Or do you side with Hussein? Or do you side with... Um, and I just don't only see Hussein. I also see um, uh, uh, Abdullah bin Zubair is on the same side. They had different strategies, hmm. right? Because they were trying to keep Hussein from going to Karbala, actually. Uh, uh, Ibn Abbas told him don't go many other great companions they made a last attempt when he was taking his family out uh, and the way uh, you know Dark Shab does say that Hus Hussein probably made a political mistake purely at a strategic level that when he showed them the letters these are your letters <laughs> they, they were definitely like convinced okay we definitely have to kill him and get rid of the evidence because the letters I'm sure you heard this from him right or you, you, I'm sure you you, you I'm heard, huh? Yeah, I'm familiar with him saying that. You know, 
So Dr. Sub says, you know, I wish that he shouldn't, he didn't show those letters because showing those letters gave him no breathing space after that because they had to get rid of the evidence. So, um, so he, you know, he says, well, that was a political itch he had that if he had avoided, then he would have been maybe okay. But, you know, this all guesses death is written when it's written. But yeah, no. So I think that um, the imams of the Shia, we can agree upon those. There's no, and I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of spirituality uh, from their works that we have currently. Uh, that can come out of that and that should be emphasized and taught in our schools because the Sunni scholars need to know what the imams of the Shia were all about. Mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, in general, history is not taught and, okay. uh, and then uh, history is just not taught in Islamic schools anymore, really, um, to study all the, you know, they're, they're taught fiqh and hadith literature mostly. And then some Quran from the perspective of Asbab al Nuzul. And I'm not belittling that stuff at all. Uh, but it, it's just a reality that our, our Dar Ulum courses went from 14 years to seven years, and seven years to four years, and four years to less than that. And the quality of the teachers, uh, like myself, and the quality of the curriculum is all gone down. And that's just, it's, it's not the fault of the Akabirin. It's, it's our fault. I, brother, it's like um, I've, in the last five or six years, I've been in a process of establishing hujja on various people and giving dava and that sort of thing. And, you know, I, I before I left the U.S., I went to uh, Sheikh Ninavi and I went to Hamza Yusuf and I went to Yasir Qadi and went through this process. And I, I did that. And I went to the Tanzim in Pakistan for two years. And I've never met someone uh, that I have so much uh, substantial uh, participation with. You know what I'm saying, brother? I feel really jama with you. You know, um, I have some, of course, particular differences, and we'll get into that when we talk about history, Islamic history. But um, I feel like you, you and I are much more on the same page than anyone else I've ever had a conversation with. So I'm grateful for that, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, may Allah increase, inshallah. So uh, do you want to take the conversation forward or should we stop here for today? Um, what are we looking at time -wise? Okay, so we, uh, maybe we have another 10 minutes. Okay. Let me just wrap up the, the analogy, the Ibrahim and Ishmael, uh, Isaac and Ishmael analogy really quickly and then we can end, inshallah. Um, so basically, uh, Isaac al-Islam is on Hassan al-Islam in the same way that there's no anbiya in the zuriyat of Ishmael al-Islam until Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa So in the same way, in the lineage of Hassan al-Islam, there is no what I call mutahir or mehdi imam. Mehdi, right? That's the way I look at it. And then in Isaac al-Islam, in the zuriyat of Isaac al-Islam, you have anbiya continuously at the beginning of Ummat Musa, right? Or, or Millat Ibrahim, I mean, you have this continuous, uh, you know. And so in the same way, the first 12 Imam, which is very, they have tahafuz, ithna athar, this, this idea is in the Hadith and is mehfuz in the Hadith, like 12 Imams, 12 Khulafa and Mehdi Imams, right? So these 12 Imams of the Itna Ashar or the Shia, or whatever, they, I believe, were Mehdi. They were mutahir and they were mehdi and the sabab and isbab of that, we can talk about that later, but uh, Sayyidina Fatima al-Islam's tahara, Sayyidina Ali al-Islam's tahara made their zuriyat have a certain level of tahara and mehdadiyat. And so that is, there's a tasalsul of that for 12 imams in my theology. And that is equivalent, right? Because that is equivalent to, uh, and that's in the Zuriyat of Hussein, Sayyidina Hussein al-Islam. And so just like in the Zuriyat of Isaac al-Islam, who is the younger brother, you have the continuous anbiya, it is similar to that pattern. It is on the same naqsha, right? Mm. Um, I think that that completes the analogy. Yeah, two two get... things that just as Hussein, not Hussein, Hassan gave up his Khilafah. Mm -hmm. He gave up his right to be a Khalifa. It is from then his Zuriyah that we have the Mahdi. Mm -hmm. Right? So he, because he gave up, so Allah will give through his progeny the Mahdi. This is one uh, way of looking at it. Uh, the other similarity, I don't know if you have something to say about that, is but the way uh, the Prophet knew based upon certain narrations 
Um, and they may be weak narrations, but there are multiple of them, uh, which is that the prophet knew that his grandchildren will be sacrificed, mm -hmm. right? Very much like Ibrahim was told to sacrifice his son. Now, that's not a very strong analogy because it happens in very different ways. But, um, but the rest of it is very strong, especially if you look at Durud and you study the Durud and what it tells you about the prophet. Because he's telling you that I want for myself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the way it was given to Ibrahim, right? And so he, it's a very humble drood in a sense that it's, he's not doing it only for himself, but he's doing it for his entire uh, dhurriya. And he's doing it for his, his all of the Ahlul Bayt or uh, all of Ali Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, inshallah, we can end here and then we'll continue maybe in two days. Inshallah. Okay, inshallah. Okay, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah.